Ontario's progressive conservative government has just passed Bill 156, the Security from Trespass and Food Safety Act. Representing the Animal Protection Party, Liz White argues that this bill violates our charter rights and that it will unreasonably limit legitimate exposure of systemic animal cruelty. So Liz, what are our charter rights and how does this stand in violation of them? Well, the Charter protects our right to freedom of expression, freedom of speech, um, and that's manifested in a number of different ways. So let's say, for example, an investigative journalist was to go into, in the course, of, I found out something that was untoward that that person wanted to investigate. It happened to be on a farm. The person signed up as a worker on the farm. Um, documented whatever the situation was, perhaps uh, cruelty or abuse or neglect or whatever, um, and uh, would bring that information out and report on it and maybe actually get something done about it. Um, this particular piece of legislation, I think, would prohibit that. And so um, it begins to, to be, begins to impinge on our rights to be able to find out what's going on and express our concern about it. Um, and so we're looking at um, uh, hiring a lawyer to investigate the possibility of a charter challenge because, you know, in the course of, um, I presented at the committee in the course of the discussions at the committee and looking at the, uh, the submissions afterwards, everybody talked about uh, charter rights for humans and I can't think of, other than the animal groups that presented, that any of the MPPs or the other presenters talked about what happens to the animals in these facilities. Mm -hmm. It wasn't talked about. Discussion about animals was just not talked about. In fact, Last Chance for Animals, who had done in 2017 an investigation on a goat dairy farm in Ontario and uncovered some pretty terrible video footage of what was happening to them um, asked at the committee if they could show the footage and they were denied so it was very clear that people didn't want to go to that place where you know we knew animals are subjected to extreme neglect suffering and cruelty um, and that uh, they didn't want to talk about that yeah, so my understanding is there were a number of voices from various organizations, animal rights organizations, animal liberation groups, and also individuals just concerned about animals, trying to draw that to their attention, but but you're saying they, they just didn't want anything to do with it. Let's talk about the process of this bill passing. I understand there were secret hearings. Well, there, you know, who, it's difficult to tell because we're in a COVID situation. And so the legislature isn't functioning uh, normally. Um, what I would say about the process is that they had long and uh, detailed talks with the industry, um, with the farming industry, with the broader uh, agricultural industry, with the slaughterhouses, with the trucking associations. Um, we were not afforded that same respect. Um, or 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 um, a reach out by the government to determine what uh, what our position was. There was none of, none of that. Animal groups were well represented at the hearings, which were only two days. We each had seven minutes, so we were all very confined um, to a certain uh, time frame and uh, unable to um, show video footage like Last Chance for Animals wanted to do. And um, so I think it was a very biased process. It was clear from the beginning that the government uh, was bound and determined to do everything in its power in this bill to protect, so-called protect, um, the farmers, the slaughterhouses, and the trucking associations that, that bring animals to slaughter. Um, and, uh, and the animals were completely absent in that discussion. And what's interesting is that the minister and a number of the MPPs said, well, we now have the PAWS Act. That's the Provincial Animal Welfare Services Act that 
has taken over from the OSPCA in terms of cruelty investigations, that if anybody sees anything bad happening to farm animals, all you have to do is call PAWS and somebody will come and do an investigation. Well, when you read through PAWS, they've exempted agriculture mm -hmm. from, from the act. So short of having a barn full of animals that they have been left starved to death, or you know those sort of extreme events, these ongoing uh, issues that occur with farm animals in terms of their care um, would simply not be addressed under the PAWS Act. So uh, farm animals don't have, virtually have no protection in mm -hmm. Ontario now. Mm -hmm. And um, the implications, are, you know, animal cruelty certainly is is uh, an, uh, of utmost importance. But we're also talking about things like worker safety, and then and then health uh, precautions. You know, we're seeing hundred how many twenty seven thousand eight hundred and eighty eight cases of COVID within slaughterhouses in the U.S. Apparently, and two hundred of those cases are among inspectors who are the safest of the safe. So, yeah. so I mean that. That's also going to become a concern if, if we're not able to report out. So people working in that industry, if they blow the whistle, then this, this, there's no protection for them, I guess. There is, I, I, would, I would argue, if I were a lawyer advising somebody in a plant about a complaint, uh, about their rights to complain, I would say you don't have much protection. Um, I, you know, workers are already worried about complaining. Um, there have been a number of complaints of people working in slaughterhouses and number of the slaughterhouses in Ontario. And they, you know, they all want to be interviewed uh, anonymously because they're worried that they're going to get fired. And so you think about that on top of the Bill 156 and on top of, you know, being fearful to report that they're working too closely together, that they don't have any personal protection, that there's no distance between them or, or no, um, you know, barriers between workers. And you look at these, you look at the cutting floor and the closeness which with everybody is doing it. Um, you realize that, uh, that the workers as well do not have any real protection. And when you're killing half a million chickens a day in one slaughterhouse, 45,000 pigs a week in another slaughterhouse, you realize that this is just one of those fast assembly lines. And, you know, the idea that animals and people in those facilities are going to be protected under this law at, or will not be protected under this law because they won't be allowed to complain. Mm, and nobody can go in and inspect it. Yeah, and you know, I was I've learned from listening to um, Dr. Barnard and the the people's or the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. They do a, a daily podcast, really with lots of updated information. And now they're finding that, you know, it, today Dr. Barnard said, if you're eating a piece of meat, you want to ask who was the last person to handle that piece of meat. Because yeah. if the virus can get into the packaging and into the product and go into the freezer, and apparently you take that package out a year later and the COVID comes back to life. So just another um, scary reason to, you know, let's get off of the off of the animal products altogether and get these people some better jobs. I'm concerned also that this bill, it seems like, is um, the second in Canada now, provincial-wise. Is it, did they use Bill 27 in Alberta as a sort of a precedent to say, well, this is, they've already done it there, so we should do it here too? Well, they, they may have watched the process. I mean, it was interesting in Alberta, the, the, the bill basically appeared and got done in a very short period of time. And I think so quickly that most people didn't have any time to react or get ready. Whereas uh, Bill 156, which is a little bit different than uh, the Alberta bill, um, took longer to come to fruition and so allowed for uh, a greater degree of organizing among animal protection groups and others um, in opposition to this bill. So, um, you know, I think the next province that tries is going to have even a harder time. Um, but I think that there is a real concern, which is why I think we need to really work on doing a court challenge on this bill, um, and maybe even the Alberta bill, is to put a stop to other provinces bringing this piece of legislation in. Because you can tell, in, in, you know, it wouldn't surprise me at all, under COVID we have a bunch of people dying in nursing homes, and their families are now suing the nursing homes 
And, you know, our premier is toying with the idea of um, protecting nursing homes from those sorts of, of, of actions. And so it becomes, it wouldn't surprise me if it were, became a thing that you couldn't complain about what was going on in a nursing home because you're protecting, you know, corporate interests who run these facilities. Right. So um, I think it's really important for everybody's perspective to actually challenge this bill. Right. Well, and in, in the case of animal agriculture, you know, the, the Canadian government also is subsidizing that industry. So in a sense, I guess they want to keep it going or something. I don't know. But also now, at the same time, Trudeau has just announced a $100 million investment in this Winnipeg plant-based company. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's great. But I, I, I wish he'd take a look at what, um, what, what money he gives to the animal agriculture industry and at least match it. You know, we're talking about uh, uh, significantly more money than that. I think it's, I, I mean, he should be praised for doing it. It's a really good start. And I think it's really interesting that the fact that they've actually cocked up some money for something like that, I think speaks to the notion that out there things are moving. And I think the government of Ontario's Bill 156 is more a, a, a tactic of fear than it is of confidence. They're worried that there is an erosion of the meat industry um, and that COVID-19 has displayed all of the weaknesses of our current way of meat delivery to Canadians. And, um, and so I think they're concerned that if they don't do everything to back up the meat industry, that it's gonna change. Right. And, uh, you know, what we said to them is it is going to change. There's nothing you can do about that. Right. You know, people are going to understand that eating meat is not very healthy and that uh, they're going to begin to change. It's not healthy for the environment or for us. And certainly not for the animals. Certainly. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, and the environment. Yeah. And everything. Um, and so, you know, I have to say one thing about the transfer of wealth to um, the Winnipeg based company. That's great. Um, but you know, it's uh, what sp sprang to mind is a, a similar thing to what happened with the uh, legalization of marijuana. So, prior, just prior to the legalization of marijuana, you had all these little independents, locally owned small businesses, and um, one of the local activists here who's been working for legalization, and I would say Ted Smith, he's one of the people who helped it happen through his years of effort. He warned us they're going to just corporatize this whole thing. And sure enough, that's what happened. And so it seems like the, it's a, it's a good, it's, you know, it's a different story, but it's a similar story in that he's giving a hundred million dollars to one particular corporation. Yeah. And what does that do to all the other small folks trying, you know what I mean? Well, I think the, you know, it, it's, it's a fallacy for us to think that just if we replace the large agribusiness, farm animal agribusiness, with a plant-based agribusiness, that that's going to solve our problems. It isn't. What, what we know to be true is that we have to change all of our practices, and that means how we farm, you know, how we produce our food, where we get it, how far it's transported, you know, all that sort of stuff. And all, if we take that roadmap to something that is environmentally sustainable and healthy for us and healthy for the planet, it's all local small practices. If you look at things like a stock-free certified organic farm or a biocyclic vegan agricultural farm, they're all pretty small because if you can't use broadly based pesticides, and you can't base, use uh, animal fertilizers. You have to farm differently. You, you, know, you can't spray the pests, so-called. You, know, you have to go and pick them off. So it begins to define the size of the farms. And that's better for the environment. It's better for us because we buy locally. You know, it's all small base stuff and, um, and it becomes more sustainable for the planet. So what, what we're hoping to do is to, to um, provide a roadmap. How do you, how do we get from this 
ridiculous situation that we're in now with these just in time, you know, uh, ongoing huge meat consumption activities to a space where we're predominantly plant based, but also ecologically sound, not just a replacement of a mega system. Right, right. And, 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 you know, this coalition government, uh, kudos to them for acknowledging this shift. And hopefully they'll include other voices in this process, voices who have done the research and have mapped a way forward already. Okay, well, so you know, and there are, there are, there are farmers who are practicing this right now in Canada. Stock free organic, certified organic agriculture. So they're not using any animal products at all. They can't use any animal products. So it's an entirely different way of farming. You've got to understand soil composition. You've got to understand all that sort of stuff, which isn't what we do now. We simply put fertilizers on, we plow it under, then we pesticide it when it's not good, and so on and so forth. And, and it breaks down uh, healthy soil. And soil is foundational. Extreme Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, and so now on the heels of Bill 156, we saw this terrible tragedy with yeah. Regan Russell's. It's a moment for Regan Russell. You yeah. were at the vigil the other night. What do you want to say about that? Well, just to begin with, I know and I knew Regan um, from 19 in the 1980s when we were at the Toronto Humane Society. Um, one of our board members, George Dupra, knew Regan in 1979 around the seal hunt. So she was active in the community um, and lived her values for a very long time. When we were all removed from the Toronto Humane Society and formed Animal Alliance, she was there with us to do all that. She and Rob Laidlow with Zuchek and I went out to save the uh, wild horses on the Suffield base in, in Alberta. So we worked together uh, off and on for many, many years. So I, on Friday, I, I mean, I, my, I still wake up in the morning and I, I can barely think about it. Um, I was on the phone with somebody and they said there's been this accident. And, um, and my colleague called and, and told me it was Regan. And, uh, you know, I it, it it was I don't know I don't know what to say. Um, a number of us have written um, in memory of her. I'm yet to do that. I'm going to try and do that today. Um, but it was uh, a tremendous loss and a terrible tragedy. Um, the vigil on Sunday was at Fearman's, and um, it was out where people normally stand. Um, and her mom and dad came, um, and uh, you know people in the community who have worked on Pig Save and uh, many other organizations were there, um, just sort of standing together and thinking about what a wonderful person Reagan was and what a big loss it was for our community. Yeah, a Fearman's slaughterhouse. What a name, right? Um, and <laughs> yeah. my understanding, um, checking in with social, in social media with some of the local vegans is the story that we've heard. It seems like, you know, this is a regular vigil where the animal save movement, they stop the trucks for just a couple of minutes, uh, before they enter the slaughterhouse and they try, they give water to the pigs. This is where Anita was arrested, I believe. Yeah. 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 Year, a year or two ago. And um, so Regan was there uh, doing that. And then the signal was given for the truck to proceed. And he proceeded rather quickly is what I is what I've heard. Um, do you know what what the status is on on the driver and the vehicle or what, what's going on with it? Apparently, there's an investigation going on. Um, and I you know, I know a lot of people are saying a lot of things about what happened there, um, but I, I, I've been inclined to wait to see what the investigation uh, reveals. It's interesting because, um, you know, when it, one of the trucks went by when we were there, and, um, and I've been around those trucks before, and you realize when you stand in front of it how high the grill is that you know, it might be easy for somebody not to see somebody there. I don't, 
who knows, mm -hmm. who knows. And, um, and so, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping there's lot, there were lots of cameras there. People took uh, videos on their phone and I believe there's uh, cameras there on, on site, on the Fearman site, uh, looking out on the street. So there should be ample footage um, for the police to do a proper investigation and figure out what exactly happened. Yeah. So have you, you know, I, I haven't participated in any direct action like that, but I've, you know, I watched the videos and, and just the idea that they can transport these animals without in such crowded containers without any, it, and they get there and they're thirsty and it must be horrible in the heat of the summer. And so yeah. we don't seem to have any legislation around transport of animals in Canada. Is that right? There is. The oh. Canadian Food Inspection Agency um, has established uh, requirements for transport. So you can, um, you, you can only, mostly hours. It's mostly about hours. Mm. But uh, so, you know, we used to, cows, you used to be able to transport for 52 hours without food, rest, or water. Um, and pigs were 36 hours. Some of this has changed. So the, the uh, amount of time has gone down, but not sufficiently. In Europe, it's eight hours. Here, it's like 24 hours or 36 hours. And you can imagine with the animals as crowded as they are, um, that they, um, that, you know, it's, it's really difficult to be standing like that for 24 hours. Um, and in a metal container that tends to attract heat and hold it in. Um, and in some cases, like with, um, with Maple Lodge farms, chickens are coming from Ohio and Quebec, spent hens. So these are birds that have been utterly diminished in terms of calcium. They're featherless, most of them, or mostly featherless. They're jammed into crates. Many of them have had broken bones as a result of the, so putting them into the crates. And they can be on the truck for 24 hours or longer. And, um, and, they, and then they go to slaughter. So, you know, you, it's pretty grim stuff. Even, even if it was not, 24 hours, it was 15 hours with that kind of temperature. So the, the uh, codes of practice, which are voluntary, say that you shouldn't really ship animals if it's this high in temperature or this cold. Um, but as far as I can tell, those temperatures are not at all complied with because we have a meat industry that's uh, a slaughter industry that's just in time. You can't wait. When we sat through the Maple Lodge Farms court case, they said, you couldn't wait a day for the broiler chickens because in a day the birds would have grown so much they wouldn't fit on the slaughter line in one day. So that the, the point of that was that if the temperature is cold or too cold or too hot, um, then it has real impact on the economy of the industry that needs to get birds of a certain size and weight and look to slaughter. And so they have to go. Hmm. It doesn't matter. Well, there's clearly lots of work to be done for the animals and um, <laughs> Animal Protection Party is certainly uh, on the front lines doing a lot of that work and now championing uh, uh, the appeal, I guess, to Bill 156. Uh, is that well, how there's, like? there's certain things that we have to determine. Um, does somebody have to uh, violate the bill or be charged under the bill in order for the bill to be um, to go through the court process. Um, there are other aspects of the bill that we need to check on. So I, we have to get we have to we have to hire a lawyer to do some preliminary work for us in that regard. Um, so it will depend on that. But our our intent is, regardless, is that uh, we'll either work with other groups as uh, and go as an intervener or you know if other groups won't do it then we'll probably uh, um, head something up ourselves okay so people can support your work and find more about this including how to contact the people who voted um, on this bill and yep. uh, at animalprotectionparty.ca or you're on various social media yep and I guess uh, Animal Protection Party, we can donate to and uh, yeah. get a tax rebate. 
you can. It's a really good tax rebate. It's at $400. If you decide you can afford $400, you get $300 right directly off your income tax. So it's a really good deal. It's like giving $100 when you give $400. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks again, Liz, and for Thank all you. your good work there. Yeah. Thank you very much.